is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Abhorson, Part 3, Chapters 19, 20, and 21. A Tin of Sardines, The Beginning of the End, and Deeper into Death. In these chapters... So it turns out everybody sort of thinks that Mogget was up to no good when it comes to Clor. And also, I think Mogget might have slipped up and started to say something about how Clor used to be an Abhorson. I don't like any of this at all. What the fuck? Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Abby for commissioning this episode. Abby and Laura are in the chat. Hello, you two, you troublemakers. Um, so chapter 19, a tin of sardines. First of all, guys, I need to say that this was the fastest 50 pages that I ever read. <laughs> I don't know what happened in terms of like my disconnect with time I finished my, like, cause I, what I do when I read is I will jump ahead 50 pages and then I will figure out to the right and left of that exact 50 where the closest to 50 pages is at the start of a new chapter. So I jumped ahead. I saw that chapter 22 began at like the 49 page mark or 51 page mark. And I was like, okay, I put my little marker on my Kindle on that page so that I know when I reach it, this is the spot I have to stop. And so I knew that it was 50 pages. I knew that I had done it correctly, but I kid you not, when I reached that marker, I felt like I'd been reading for like 15 minutes and I double checked and triple checked and then even before I started this recording, I went and like checked again because I was like, there's no way that was so she, like that just went by way too fast. And w there's no way I, m I fucked up and I'm going to start this and, and we're going to realize that I read half of what I was supposed to read because I just like mess up on the reading for this all the time. Like it'll be no surprise, but no 50 pages. And I'm just like this wrapped up in what's going on that it just went by like nothing. Um, so Clor flees at the very end of chapter 18. So when we start chapter 19, everybody who is left, all of the dead hands, just begin to sort of lose their focus because she was the one that was leading them. And it's not like when she disappears and isn't leading them anymore, they don't just like fall to the ground without any animation to them anymore. It's simply that they don't have anyone directing them. It reminds me a little bit of, um, in Dresden Files and Deadbeat, spoilers, there's, uh, some, there's a way of dealing with zombies where you raise them and you keep a beat going and the zombie sort of is attracted to that beat as if it were a heartbeat. It sort of feels like life to them. So they're drawn to this beat and the person who rose them and is uh, controlling them can sort of in like infuse them with their own will and use them like puppets, like extensions of their own will. And if that person is taken out of the equation and that drumbeat stops, the zombies don't just lose power. They simply don't have any motivation of any sp specificity anymore. So even though it might be the, f like the first thing someone thinks of is, Oh, well we'll take out the ringleader and then we don't have to worry. The truth is taking out the ringleader just leads to total chaos. And now you're left with a bunch of zombies going in all directions instead of focusing on one goal altogether, which maybe is what you want if they are about to achieve their goal, but it might be worse to deal with in the end than 
letting the person who's controlling them stay alive because at least then they are not just attacking randomly whomever happens to be nearby. So that's sort of what I get the vibe is happening here when she disappears. They just all sort of like go nuts. Um, and I love this description of how each of them deals with it. Mogget ran between their legs laughing as charter magic fire burnt through their sinews and sent them crashing to the ground. The dogs barking sent their spirits back into death and Saraneth commanded them to relinquish their bodies. So yeah, it's a fun, like, you know, everybody getting to use their skills and take these things out. And eventually they are all broken down. Now here comes Lyriel talking to Mogget guys. I got to be perfectly honest here. I was laughing at Mogget like basically coming to just shit talk Clore and that that was what he like contributed to the conversation. And I didn't really think about exactly what he was doing because she says, why did you tell Clore to run? We were winning. And what was that no face thing about? Now, I thought it would be self-evident that the no face thing was about the fact that Clore does not have a face anymore. But maybe it's not that simple. Maybe there's something else going on. Also, I thought the runaway was just taunting. Like, I didn't think it was really him being like, hey, you should run. I thought it was like, oh, yeah, why don't you just run away, you dumb loser? You aren't going to win anyway. Look at how outmatched you are, you jerk. But she really seems to think, and so does the disreputable dog, that that was Mogget basically warning Clore off, being like, oh, no, she's going to send you past the ninth gate, and then you're not going to be able to come back. So if I were you, I would fucking bounce. And it's really surprising to me that I didn't pick up on this at all. Like, usually when there's sort of a double meaning to things, I am able to sense it. But this was one where I genuinely just saw face value shit talking, you know. Um, so, yeah, they were they're both like pretty suspicious of Mogget throughout the rest of these chapters. But I'm not convinced that that is warranted. Um, I don't know. We will see. But, yeah, he says it was quicker, which I thought was the point. Clore was always overcautious, even when she was in a alive. Oh, really? Even when she was in a capital A. Mugget. What's up, buddy? What are you, uh, what are you talking about over there? Hmm? You think you want to, uh, Anything you want to share with the class? Let us know that, uh, if you know what Clore is and where she comes from. Uh, want to share any of that information? Want to tell anybody about it? Uh, you want to tell them what the fuck is going on again? Hmm? How about that? Hmm? You fuck! How dare you not tell them what the fuck you know! Ugh! I am disgusted. And nobody seems to notice that he almost says this. That was a very particular set of, of syllables that went together there. I feel like it's pretty self-evident what he was about to say. Oh, nobody's... Nobody. What about the disreputable dog? Does the disreputable dog not know who Clor is? I have a hard time believing Mogget knows something the dog does not. And if so, why is the dog not sharing? What's, what's, what's happening? Why is nobody talking to each other? Communication, kids. Fuck. So finally, Lyriel is like, Sam basically takes Mogget's side and uh, the dog says, well, I'm not satisfied with Mogget's motivation or explanation, but I do think that we should get the fuck out of here. Um, Abby says, maybe the dog already knows and doesn't think it's important. I don't want the dog making those kinds of evaluations. You share everything and they figure out what's important. Okay. Nobody gets to just be like, oh, well, you know, I didn't want to let you know that she was related to you in some way because why? It's too distracting. God forbid. 
in this war against the undead, we'd be distracted. Like, come on. I I don't like the attitude of these like elder creatures where they need the humans to like be out here taking care of business, but they don't want to bring them in all the way in on the information. It's using them in a way that's gross to me. Either you guys are a team and you let them know what you know, or you have to be like straight up with them about the fact that you're not planning on being totally honest and that you're kind of instruct like using them as a bit of a puppet. And I don't like that. Of course, I'm not going to say that because I'm sure that to them, it doesn't look that way because they think of mortals, I'm guessing, as basically children is the vibe that I get, right? Like it's, it's creatures that live very short lives that flicker out and you're still here. I can imagine it being difficult to take that seriously when it's not only have they not been alive long enough to understand what you understand about the world, but they literally never will be alive as long as you and that's they're never going to achieve that. So I suspect there's a bit of I don't want to use the word contempt because that feels a little strong, but I feel like that's honestly the most accurate. I feel like there's a bit of contempt there of just like, well, I know what I know and I don't need to tell you. And just like says who? It's not your choice. You I would argue are here to to be the vessel that shares that sort of information, that that is your job, but they don't seem to see it that way. Um, Laura says, I don't think the dog cares. She's going to do her. When has the dog ever been totally honest? I mean, look at her guiding Lyriel through the library. I've always believed she was aware of what Lyriel would find. RE that little room. That's my entire point. Laura, I feel like you're arguing against an argument that I'm not making. My hope, my thing is that the dog, like they are neither of them honest and they never have been. And I don't like it. I don't like the attitude that they seem to carry regarding mortals and the way that they're like ma manipulating them into doing the thing that they want them to do. It just feels really shady. Um, Abby says, yeah, she's always only given Lyriel the information she thinks she needs, right or wrong. Yeah, I mean, rightly or wrongly. Um, I just think that's ugly. And it's very Dumbledore-esque. You know, it's like, I think that I have a sense of who you are as a person and I'm going to decide based on what I know of you, what you can handle and what you can't handle. And while there's an aspect of that that's understandable, there's also something really insulting about it. And there's no way to not feel like you were used a little bit at the end of it all. So I can see the disreputable dog being an ally, but I would never think it was a friend. It doesn't feel friendly. It feels like it watches out for Lyriel in the way that it needs to in order to get done what needs getting done. But I am not convinced that it's her friend. I am not convinced that if it came down to achieving something at the expense of Lyriel or saving Lyriel at the expense of the achievement, that it would choose the latter. I don't feel like it would. I, it, it just seems impersonal in a way that Lyriel doesn't seem to think it is. Lyriel trusts the dog in a way that I don't feel has been earned. And it's understandable that she does because she doesn't have anyone but Samoth. And she doesn't, like Samoth, they have really just met. And Samoth, you know, he, he has gone through so much recently that he has sort of like pulled back to a degree. I can understand her leaning on the dog for a feeling of somebody watching her back that has like real power, but I would warn her against that. Were I able to speak with her and just be like, listen, I'm not saying the dog doesn't have your back. I'm saying 
if she has your back up to a point and you just like be on the lookout for where that point is because you don't know. So, uh, Abby says yes. Or the doctor, even like elves and Lord of the Rings, I guess it's a thing that immortals do. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm saying. It feels like parents with their kids. I'm not going to let you know all of this. Cause I don't want, first of all, there's the argument of like, Oh, it would hurt you to know that. And then there's also like, yeah, you would take this information and do something really impulsive and stupid with it, which you think is smart, but which I, who has some life experience knows is like the opposite of the smart thing to do here. Um, yeah, so I'm just the whole thing. I'm just very suspicious of everybody here and I don't love feeling this way. Um, so at this point, like having brought down hundreds of dead hands, it is... Un understandable why they and the other soldiers are feeling kind of high on themselves. They have a really different vibe on this side of the battle than they did at the beginning because they really think that they managed something here. Um, and it says the major beamed at them as they matched his pace and several soldiers slapped their rifles in salute. The atmosphere was very different from what it had been only a few minutes before. So they, at this point, Feel like, oh yeah, well, we killed all these and we're going to be fine. I, we're, we'll definitely get there ahead of them. And Major Green is like, I think we found a road that can beat Hedge there. Um, they can't possibly be there if they go the same way any earlier than us. And thankfully, Samoth is like, okay, look, I understand that you really want to believe that this is like how he's going to go. But he's not stupid. Hedge has been planning this for a while and he has to have seen the potential pitfalls and obstacles this has been done really carefully if there is another way that is faster even if it's unexpected i believe he will take it do you all have anything any alternative for how he could get the hemispheres to this farm and uh finally tyndall says well they guess they could take them to the sea, put them on boats, and then take them south, but there's nowhere to load them near the western strong point. And the major is like, mm, there's a navy dock, actually. Yeah, there is. And Lirio's like, boom, that's it. That's what he's doing. Like, we, we thought we really had the advantage here. I am unsurprised to find that we, in fact, do not. Um... And at this point, Sam jumps in again and is like, yeah, they're going to like, they won't have the advantage of steam to get there. They'll have to sail because they don't have the, you know, the magic will interfere with the uh, technology, but he can work the wind to his advantage. So it'll be less than eight hours before they get there. And everybody at this point freaks out and they split up and just go spit like sprinting to the trucks and like peel out of there you know it's really kind of a dramatic moment um so at this point they're on the back of the truck again and samoth pulls out this uh container of sardines and it's a weird thing guys i don't know why i'm so suspicious of this but like i am a little bit Magus said like what's this and he says well i said that i would give you some fish and uh so here it is. Moggett doesn't even know what sardines are. And he says, why is there a key? Is this some sort of a horse and joke? Which I thought was really funny, actually. Um, so Sam shows him that you take the key and unwind the tin back. And Moggett is just like, oh, damn. As the smell hits him, he's just like, yes, please. Um, why are you giving me this? You like fish, said Sam. Beside, I said I would. So... Moggett kind of stares Sam down in this way that's like, I don't entirely believe you, but he can't resist it. And he eats the whole tin. I feel like it's a suspicious moment myself, but I cannot for the life of me imagine what it was like. I thought at first maybe Sam had drugged the fish, but it's a closed tin. There's no way he could have tampered with that. Oh, isn't there magic? Hello. 
I didn't even like, ugh. he literally makes objects like this with magic. Like that's his thing. He could definitely have opened and resealed it. Oh, I'm an idiot. But Mocket gets a second tin later. So he doesn't like nothing occurs after him eating the first one. So that theory is kind of shot to hell. So yeah, God, I don't know. Um, Lirial and the dog glanced at this exhibition of gluttony, but were both more interested in what was going on outside and behind them. Lirial pushed aside the canvas flap, and they looked past the three following trucks. Lirial could sense the second, much larger group of dead and shadow hands that was advancing along the road. The shadow hands, which were both more powerful than the dead hands and unconstrained by flesh, were moving very swiftly, some of them leaping and gliding like enormous bats ahead of the main body of their shambling corpse-dwelling brethren. They would undoubtedly wreak great trouble somewhere, but she could not spare them any further thought. So, what the fuck? First of all, I really, that description, uh, leaping and gliding like enormous bats... I feel like it would be less scary if they were just gliding, but it's like that combo one, two punch of leaping and gliding that makes them feel really like extra creepy somehow. Um, and she whispers to the dog, like, what if they've joined up the hemispheres by the time we get there? What if we're too late? And the dog doesn't answer her. And she's like, uh, so I'm going to have to go into death and use that fucking dark mirror and find out how they bound it to begin with and like do it all over again. And the dog still doesn't answer her. And then finally, Lyriel asks, will you come with me? And the dog says, yes, wherever you walk, I will be there. Um, but we shouldn't go unless there is no other choice. Perhaps we will still reach the lightning farm before hedge. And it's just a like really, I, silly like oversight on my part but i really just never thought of the possibility that they would get there too late you know like i should have un i should have realized that's the whole reason lyriel has the dark mirror because she wanted to know how they bound it and was asking and she isn't really given the straight answer and so of course it's going to turn out that like she has to go back and and witness it and figure it out but I just didn't think that that was going to be the thing. Like, I thought that, that they were going to go back and figure out how it was bound in an effort to do something to stop them being brought back together in the first place. Like, that they, they would find out, you know, okay, but like, I'm, I'm thinking of Rogue One. Where it's like, oh, well, we built this thing, but I definitely built in this, like, uh, one particular fail-safe, like, that you can push this tiny little spot on it and the whole thing will just go up like a goddamn match. That's sort of what I thought, was that she would, like, eventually look at the dark mirror and it would give her a clue as to how to keep the halves from being brought together in the first place. It never occurred to me that they would successfully bring the halves together and this thing would get out and she would have to maybe come up with an, a whole alternative way of binding it that might not even have anything to do with the hemispheres. Like, can we just talk about how faulty this binding method was to begin with? Like, these hemispheres should have been buried hundreds of miles apart. The fact that they were buried so close to one another is kind of hilarious in retrospect. Like they were right there. You know, I feel like this should have been handled like Horcruxes where they're just scattered across the country, like wide apart. But yeah, no. Uh, okay, guys, just keep them right near each other where some lunatic can find them both pretty easily. Um, so let's see, Mogget opens his eye, the dog is staring at him and he closes his eye again and the dog is like, mm -mm, no, do not fucking try it. Tell me 
Why I shouldn't take you by the scruff of your neck and throw you off right now. I'd only run behind. Besides, she gave me the benefit of the doubt. Can you do anything less? I am not so charitable, said the dog, showing her teeth. Let me remind you that should you turn, I will make it my business to see that you are ended for it. Will you? purred Mogget, opening his other eye. What if you can't? And the dog just growls enough to, like, wake Sam up and they have to be like, nothing, nothing, everything's fine. Um, so then we go to Nicholas, who, bless his boots, is just trying so hard to fight back. Nicholas, you precious little angel. Oh, I want somebody to come down and give you a cup of cocoa and a blanket. So he's just like passed out on a fucking pile of straw as a bunch of hedges men are working together to get one of the hemispheres up onto the shore. And he is like still outside of his own mind here and is really like gleeful that they've gotten this far. Everything is going to fall into place. And he's like really looking forward to it. Then there's this moment. It's really chilling. Thunder cracked and someone screamed. A man fell away from the boat, his skin blackened and hair on fire. He lay on the dock, writhing and groaning, till one of the other men stepped down and quickly cut his throat. Nick watched it all happen quite calmly. It was just the price of dealing with the hemispheres, and they were all that mattered. Uh, and so another dude dies, and like Nick literally doesn't even notice. Um, Soon the first hemisphere would be ready to be shifted into the ruined shell of the timber mill. It would be loaded into a special cradle mounted on a waiting railway wagon, one of two on the same sh short, uh, short stretch of track. At least that was what Nicholas had ordered. It occurred to him that he hadn't actually inspected the lightning farm. He'd drawn the plans and paid for its construction before leaving for the old kingdom, and that seemed a very long time ago. He had never seen the lightning farm in actuality. Um... So he's looking around because he's so weakened and ill that he can't easily stand up and walk. So he sees on the stretcher that there is, uh, it says, a, a simple thing of canvas and wood. Perhaps he could pull out one of the poles and use that as a staff. Very slowly he walked over. Uh, he knelt down and removed the pole, dragging it out of the canvas loops. He was about to use it when he saw something glowing on the stretcher. A piece of splintered wood painted with strange luminous symbols. Puzzled, he reached out to pick it up. So he touches it and immediately throws up. But as he does that, he senses his mind coming back and like tries to hold on to it as best he can. And by hold on to it, I mean at least keep one finger in contact with it. Because... His body is rejecting this thing. He literally isn't able to close his hand around it. So he has to figure out a way to keep it close by and keep it so that it will touch him without actually having to pick it up. Um, so he's looking at like his body and his fucking the shock of it is so real, is so real and so sad. Um he looks down and like he is so thin and covered in bruises that he gets like a little bit flipped out by it. And his shirt and pants are basically tatters, like so worn through. It's just the pockets of the pants are gone. His underwear and is gone. Everything is just like he is like a body that's been left in the ground with its clothes on to decay. Like it's started to all go and he is very, very short behind it. Um, so the cuffs on his trousers are turned up and he double checks them to make sure that they are stiff enough to hold. And he just drop, like he, he kind of, shuffles with his like open hand the piece of wood to the edge of the uh stretcher and positions his ankle under it and pushes the wood off the stretcher and gets it into the cuff of his pants um 
And I, the, the way this works, as he did it, he forgot what he was doing till a few seconds later, the trouser cuff hit against his skin. So this is like, It'll be there and it'll be gone again and it'll be there and be gone again. Like it's going to be the kind of thing that's sort of like intermittent. And that is so frustrating, but like also very, in, a very interesting way to do this, you know? Um, let's see. Abby says, I hate that Hedge didn't even bother to get him some clothes. I know. Yeah. It's just so like, it's, he isn't a person anymore. Literally not. He's already being treated like he's undead you know that's just where he's headed so inevitably that we're not even going to worry about it like who cares um so at this point nick is looking around at everybody and realizes about the dead all over again um and at this point hedge shows up and he notices again that Hedge has changed and is becoming more and more freaky looking. And it says men moved to obey his orders, though it was clear they were nearly all wounded in some way or sick, which I sort of see it as like almost radiation poisoning, you know, like this thing is just so loaded with negative magic that it's like rolling off it and affecting them. Like it's, you know, actual, uh, radioactivity um so let's see fog began to rise out of the lock thin white tendrils spiraled up and up dragging thicker trails of mist behind them hedge gestured to the right and left and the tendrils spread sideways dragging more fog up out of the water to form a wall that slowly extended down the full length of the lock as it spread sideways, it also rolled forward toward the wharf, the timber mill, the lock valley, and the hills beyond. So when we go to Liriel's POV later, she mentions the fact that this uh, this fog is made out of real water, that it's not manufactured fog, and that makes it like way harder to disperse, which I thought was interesting, actually. Um, so I'm running out of time. I really need to speed this up. But um, Hedge comes over and tries to ask Nick if he has any further instructions, but like, you know, asks the uh, fragment inside Nick really. And it responds to Hedge's question, but Nick manages to sort of like hold it back. And he sort of thinks that he's going to have to fake it, but eventually Hedge just kind of walks away as if, you know, at this point, it seems that it's pretty much on the roll on a roll. Like he doesn't really need any more instruction and he seems to be fairly secure in the idea that even if the master isn't able to come through right now, it's just a matter of time before Nick is totally, um, subdued, I guess is the word I want. Um, so we jump into chapter 20, the beginning of the end. Um, and Liriel was unaware of the desertions during the night. Every time the trucks had slowed to negotiate a sharp bend or had been forced to stop before crawling across a white, a washed out section of what was a very secondary road, soldiers who could not face the prospect of further encounters with the dead leapt from the trucks and disappeared into the darkness. The company had more than a hundred men when it left the perimeter. By the time they came to Forvale, there were only 73 left. <sighs> Don't like those odds. Not a fan of that. And it's like 73 like regular vanilla men too. I'm pretty sure. I don't think any of them has magical ability, which yikes, you know. Um, so Lirial climbs out of the truck and is looking around, sees the fog and is thinking about how that's going to be difficult to deal with. Um, and it says, uh, we have to stop them, said Sam. It's more important to stop the hemispheres from being joined, said Liriel. She hesitated for a second because they see like this, this group of people that is heading towards them. Um, we need to get up on that ridge. Come on. So they are running up to, it says Liriel ran as she had never run before. A lone figure, she splashed across the ford and cut in front of the Sutherlings. Closer to, she saw they were in family groups, often of many generations, hundreds of families. They must not be allowed to cross the ridge, said the dog, as Liriel slowed to look at them, but we must not stop. I fear the lightning is increasing. 
So she gives Sam the job of slowing all of these people down because they have these papers that they think are going to be their passport across and that they're going to be, you know, taken care of because of these promises. Um, and she has to take off and trust Sam to manage this. Sam, what he winds up doing is sort of, uh, use like, basically he uses sonorous, um, to make his voice louder. Uh, and he is telling them all the papers that you have are worthless. The promises also worthless. If you will please just stay where you're at, we'll give you farms above the wall, but you please don't go this way. And they're like listening at first, but they get pretty impatient and seem to, uh, be listening to we find out later there's like a matriarch in charge of it all and they seem when she loses her patience and is like fuck this come on we're gonna keep going they all listen to her and continue on as well um so one of the uh, silver hemispheres was already on the key it flashed blue as the lightning struck it the other hemisphere was on a boat out on the lock Though most of the lightning was hitting the hemispheres, Lyriel saw that it was also spreading out and up the slope, and most of the strikes hit the tall poles. They were lightning rods that made up Nicholas's lightning farm. Um, so at this point, she realizes, like, they're, they're not going to be able to make it there in time and stop this. Like, it's already on its way. And the dog says... The destroyer's power is less constrained here, and the destroyer is directing the lightning. Um, Hedge will have noticed us as we have noticed him. His mind is on the hemispheres for the moment, but I do not think it will be long before he orders an attack. And then she says, what about Nicholas? And the dog says, he is beyond our help now. I don't like this news. I don't like hearing he is beyond our help now. I don't like hearing that he may very well die. I don't like any of this at all. I object. Um, so they take off. And uh, this is when she hears Sam like yelling. Um, and she's hoping that that like works out. Major Green is saying like, you know, he better be able to stop them because honestly... I don't know. Like we can't just shoot these innocent people to keep them from getting there. We could try and hold them back, but we're really going to be no match for this like sheer crowd of people. Um, so to do, do, um, that means, so she says we're too late to stop them joining. And Sam says that means we've lost. And she's like, no, it does not. It means I have to go into death and figure out how it was bound in the beginning and while I do that, y'all have to watch my back because this is just going to leave her body completely exposed and vulnerable with no defenses. And that's just so scary to me. I hate it so much. Um, so she, she, she asks, uh, she tells them the dog is coming with her, asks where Mogget is. And Mogget's like, I'm here having eaten the second of the two tins. Um, and she says, Mogget, help in any way you can. Any way I can? Confirmed Mogget with a sly smile. His confirmation sounded almost like a question. Mogget, what are you doing, you little weirdo? What are you doing, Mogget? Lyriel looked around and strode to the middle of a lichen-covered stone where the spur rose slightly again after coming down the ridge. Um, so she goes into death and I love that Sam calls her aunt Lyriel at this point to which the Lieutenant is just like, wait, what aunt? Oh shit. Um, so she says, even if I do find out how the seven bound the destroyer, how can we do it? The disreputable dog looked at her with sad brown eyes, but didn't answer. Um, Listen, I don't want you guys to, like, hold me to this prediction, but why do I have a feeling Lyriel's gonna die? <laughs> I don't know if I'm making that up, but I feel like 
that look was like, basically, you're going to have to like sacrifice yourself to accomplish this. Mm. Is that who Chloris? Like, oh, guys, I have so many questions. Okay. So she reaches out to death. Um, and she hears Sam saying something, but doesn't hear what it is before she's through. And I'm hoping that that's not something totally crucial. Um, and Sam is, oh yeah, Sam's yelling, what about Nick? I should have asked. That's right. Cause we come back and, um, do, 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 I'm going to close the company in shouted green. We'll form an all around defense here. Sam nodded. He could sense the dead moving beyond the ridge. Fifty or sixty dead hands headed their way. Um, the soldiers were already running back toward the spur, the line contracting. There was nothing between the Sutherlings and their doom. Damn, swore Green. I thought you'd stopped them. I'm going to talk to them, declared Sam, making an instant decision. The dead were at least five minutes away, and Lyriel had charged him earlier to stop the Sutherlings. She would not be in danger if he was quick. You better be fucking right, sir. I do not like this. He tells Moggett to protect her, and then he runs off, and he sees that there is the matriarch. Um, so then we go on to chapter 21, Deeper Into Death. So this is really interesting. I had said before that I found the concept of different gates in death to be like really compelling, and I wanted to know more about how all of those worked. I still do. I'm very, very curious about, like, I'm hoping that we get to see even more than what we see here into the next chapter. Um, but it is very different than what I expected. It's funny because, like, I'm just so used to the representation of death being something that's sort of made familiar in a way that's like meant to be sort of disconcerting almost because it's so familiar. For example, uh, in the magicians, they go to the underworld and it's like an airport basically. Um, it feels very much like an airport or like a big corporate hotel, something like that. And there is a, a vibe that's like, Oh, isn't it funny that like death isn't that much different in some ways? Like this is so familiar that it's surprising. But in this, death is truly like an alien landscape that feels like I don't want to say it feels evil. It's it certainly doesn't. It feels like a real force though. Like and greedy. Like it's trying to get you like, it's not a passive thing that, well, when it's your time, it's your time. Death is like, you better fight back. Cause if you're not going to fight back, pff, guess what, buddy, you're done. That's it. And it's a really interesting, different approach to death than I expected. Um, so She's like remembering what she learned about the different gates in her mind. Um, and it says, but knowing these secrets was not the same as having experienced them. And Lyriel had never been past the first precinct, never even crossed the first gate. And it says that if she has any sorts of doubts, the water will take her under. She has to be really confident about this. So she gets to the first gate and, uh, it's like a wall of mist and sort of like a waterfall feel to it. Um, she spoke the words, feeling the free magic writhe and sizzle on her tongue and lips as the words flew out of her mouth. It's interesting to me that this is free magic. And I'm wondering why it needs to be like what exactly that's about. I've already shared my theory that free magic isn't inherently evil. It's just a lot more chaotic. Um, but yeah. Do, 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 sorry. Um, <laughs> Laura says like you're dead and in your house, but things are off. Yeah. Abby says, imagine having to go this deep into death when you've never been trained. Yeah. No, thank you. 
Um, the veil of mist parted as she spoke, slowly rolling aside to reveal a series of waterfalls that seemed to drop down forever into a dark and endless chasm. Lyriel spoke again and gestured to the right and left with her sword. A path appeared, cut deep into the waterfall, like a narrow pass between two liquid mountains. Lyriel stepped onto the path, the dog so close that she was almost tangled up in Lyriel's legs. As they walked, the mist closed up and the path faded behind them. After they'd gone on, a very small, sneaking spirit rose from the water near the first gate and began to walk toward life, following an almost invisible black thread connected to its navel. It twitched and gibbered as it walked, anticipating the reward its master would give for news of these travelers. Perhaps it would even be allowed to stay in life and be given a body, that greatest and most treasured delight. <sighs> I didn't want this. Nobody wanted this. The one thing I'll say is at least we're spared a physical description of what the fucking thing looks like. Because we aren't spared later with this other one. And it's very upsetting. And after having just covered, I don't know if you all listen or if you watch Gravity Falls... But I just covered an episode of Gravity Falls where there's like this shape-shifting creature that's sort of like the thing from the thing. And it has this moment where it's like sprouts spider legs and its neck grows a little bit too long. And that's almost exactly how this is described later. And I was just like, oh, man, like I just didn't want any part of that. Um... The passage through the first gate was deceptive. Lyriel couldn't tell how long it took, but soon the river had once again become a flat and endless expanse as it resumed its flow through the second precinct. So now she starts to be really, really careful because the second precinct is similar, but the thing is that it's, it's sort of treacherous and there are deep holes that you can like fall into. Um, and she counts the steps as she goes through. It says she was so intent, lost in the cadence of her steps, she almost fell into the second gate. The dog's quick grab for her belt pulled her to safety as she took one step too many, counting 11, even as her brain said, stop at 10. As quick as that thought, she tried to draw back, but the second gate's grip was much stronger than the normal current of the river. Only her valiant dog anchor saved her, though it took all the strength of both of them to drag Lyriel back from the precipice of the gate. For the second gate was an enormous hole, into which the river sank like sink water down a drain, creating a whirlpool of terrible strength. Woo! Dislike! And the dog is, like, really shook as well. Like, the both of them know that she quite nearly died. Um, and finally, when Lyriel has calmed down, it's time to go into three, like go th through this one into three. Um, she says these words, the water stops flowing down the drain. Each swirl had become a terrace, making up one long spiral path down the vortex of the gate. Um, it seemed she would have to circle around a hundred times or more to reach the bottom, but once again, Lyriel knew it was deceptive. It took only a few minutes to traverse the second gate, and she spent the time thinking about the third and the trap for the unwary. So the third seems like it's actually rather tame. It seems very calm, almost the kind of place that you would want to, like, stop and take a break. But the thing is... It's got huge waves, so it'll feel really peaceful. And then all of a sudden you will just get hit with like a tsunami wave that carries you through. So as soon, like she starts running as she gets through the gate, she's already running by the time she hits three and is sprinting as fast as she possibly fucking can. And even as she's doing that, the dog is yelling that she needs to go faster because the wave is like about to catch up on her. Um, 
She reached the mists only a step or two in front of the rushing waters, frantically calling out the necessary free magic spell as she ran. This time the dog was in front, the spell only just parting the mists ahead of her snout. As they halted, panting in the mist door created by the spell, the wave broke around them, hurtling its cargo of dead into the waterfall beyond. Lyriel waited to catch her breath and a few seconds more for the path to appear. Then she walked on into the fourth precinct. That is bananas. Like, I, the, the, especially when it says hurtling its cargo of dead into the waterfall beyond. I want to know what this looks like because there are creatures coming up out of the water. Like, the water's deep enough to hide things. When it says cargo of dead, it makes me think that there's, like, like, she can stand knee-deep in the water because she is alive, right? But if you are dead, are you under the water? Is that, like, when it says cargo of dead, can she not see bodies, essentially? Like, I know they're not really bodies, but it's it's just part they become part of the wave i'm guessing right i'm just trying to like figure out what this looks like in my head you know um she remained wary besides the known and charted dangers of each precinct there was always the possibility of something new or something so old and infrequent it was not recorded in the book of the dead which i appreciate that being mentioned there's such reliance in stories on, well, the records say, the sages say, well, in this book it says these are the things. And I really appreciate the acknowledgement that, like, books are written by people and they can do the best they can, but they're going to write from their experience and the experiences of those who contributed, and that is by no means comprehensive. There will be plenty of stuff that is outside of the purview of the author and you just cannot grow comfortable thinking that you know all there is to know about something that very few people in the world have ever experienced. Like, you can you can use that as your baseline, but don't get sloppy about it, you know? Um, so, yeah, that is just so... Ugh. Um, let's see. Laura says, just bodies all around. I'm not cut out to be an abhorse. And Abby says, I think she can see them. They've just been swept up by the massive wave. That's how I always imagined it anyway. Laura says, can you imagine being hit by one of those bodies? Ugh. <sighs> I called you two troublemakers. I wasn't wrong. Um, so do, do, do. Um, besides such anomalies, the book hinted at powers that could travel in death besides the dead themselves or necromancers. Some of these entities created odd local conditions or warped the usual natures of the precincts. Lyriel supposed that she herself was one of the powers that altered the nature of the river and its gates. So that's a really interesting thought that there's like, oh, there's things out here that could make it function differently. And then the realization that like, actually... That's kind of me. I could be that. And, you know, who knows how she's changing what's happening around her. Um, the fourth gate was another waterfall. It doesn't have any mist around it, and it looks like it's only a couple of feet deep. Um, and she says a spell that causes this ribbon of darkness to sort of unfurl out from the edge floating above the water and it's like three feet wide and she has to walk across it's basically like a sidewalk um i cannot tell you guys how little i like this whole idea like i have a fear of heights anyway um i like the idea of just being over an empty chasm is bad in and of itself the idea of there being like water below, but it's, it's water that is alive and like actively trying to fuck you up. And, and this thing is something that sh that is like magically made, which I don't know exactly if this is like how this works or not, but there's a sense to me of like, if you lose your focus, that, is that bridge just going to disappear? Like, do you know what I mean? 
because there there's magic in this world that you have to keep your focus to to activate i guess is the word i want and then there's magic that you can like put in place and it remains you you can create a magic object or infuse magic into an object you can create like charter creatures and servants and you once you've created them they just seem to kind of go until they wear out but there's a part of me that's sort of like worried in terms of is this something that is sustained while she's thinking about it or once created is this just an extant sort of bridge i hope it's the latter because i don't want her to like get wrapped up and lose focus and then that shit just disappears um so she steps out onto the path um the water had a strong metamorphic effect. A necromancer who spent any time in its waters would find both spirit and body altered and not for the better. Any dead spirit who managed to wade back this way would not resemble its once living form. I am extremely curious about that. Why does it have this, this effect? What does that effect look like on a person who isn't dead? Like what happens to a person's again? Is this what happened to Clore? What the fuck is Clore? I want to know. Um, so, even crossing this precinct by means of the dark path was dangerous. Besides being narrow, it was also the favored means of, for the greater dead or free magic beings to cross the fifth precinct themselves, going the other way. They would wait for a necromancer to create the path, then rush down it, hoping to overcome the pathmaker with a sudden vicious attack. Lyriel knew that, but even so, it was only the dog's quick bark that warned her as something came ravening down the path ahead, seemingly out of nowhere. So here's the thing, guys. It had once been human, but now it's uh, on its arms and, le and legs, like on all fours, moving like a spider. Its body was fat and bulbous and its neck jointed so it could look straight ahead even when on all fours. Nah. Mm -mm. No, sir. No, doubt it. I refuse. Absolutely not. No. Nope, 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 nope. So she shoves her sword through its, through its face, through one cheek out the back of its neck. And despite that, it's still fucking coming at her. It's not even phased by it. Um, it thrusts itself almost up to the hilt. Red fire eyes focused on Lyriel, its too wide mouth drooling spit and hissing. Go fuck yourself. Fuck you, Garth Nix. Go fuck yourself. Inconsiderate. What are you doing? Oh, God. He's like, he just read Lord of the Rings and we get to the part where the uruk like, gets stabbed and, like, just pulls the sword in so that he can, like, yank Boromir in. And he's, or is it Aragorn at that point? And he's like, yeah, I mean, that's pretty badass and everything, but, like, what if instead of the sword going through your chest, it was going through your face and you did that? Oh, Jesus. Ugh. No. She was trying to kick it off and use Sereneth to like send it back. But she isn't like balanced enough. She get caught, got caught by a surprise here. Ooh, there's a delivery. Um, a discordant note echoed out into death. And instead of feeling her will concentrated on the dead thing and the beginnings of domination, Lyriel felt distracted. Her mind wandered, and for an instant she forgot what she was doing. <sighs> Not the time, ma'am. Oh my god. Can you imagine fighting with something that looks like this, and all of a sudden you're like, shit, what was I doing again? Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> That's what happens when you're, like, folding laundry and you go into the kitchen to, like, get a soda. You forget what you were doing. You're fighting a monster. Oh my God. No. Oh, I hate it. 
So she comes back to herself. But then it happens again. The bell like rings again and she's trying to still it. But like in trying to still it accidentally rings it again. And she like kind of falls out of focus again. And this is when the creature like comes at her hard. Um, It leapt at her, planning to crush her completely beneath its ghastly pallid bulk. But the dog saw the monster tense and she guessed its intention. Instead of slipping between Lyriel's legs, she threw herself forward and planted two heavy forepaws on Lyriel's back. So the dog basically shoves Lyriel down and is like, get the fuck out of the way. And this thing that's about to launch itself at her just goes right over her. But it does manage to grip up a lock of her hair and yank it out by the roots, which, while not fatal, worries me because I don't know how magic works regarding that sort of thing. But I have this like idea in my head about magic that you can use somebody's hair to focus and then harm them that way. And I don't like this creature having any piece of her to work with. I dislike this a great deal. Um, So she turns around and looks at the dog and the dog looks fucked up. The hair on her back was up like a boar bristle hairbrush, red fire dripping from the from teeth the size of Lyriel's fingers. Joe, like, can we just talk about that? That's fucking nuts. There was a madness in her eyes as she looked back at her mistress and Lyriel's like, hey, buddy. Like, she's scared of the dog for the first time. And the dog's like, hey, sorry. Got mad there for a second. Um, And the dog finally sort of calms down and changes back into the more familiar form. And it's like, all right, listen, you've got to pull Rana that bell because it's not going to fuck you up as bad. And we really need to like, get on this. We need to hurry. And I love Lyriel's like, I could never do this without you. And the dog's like, fucking duh. Yeah, no, you definitely couldn't. Let's go. Like, there's no bit of like, Oh, sweetie, you're doing great. There's just like, no, you'd be dead. Um, Can you hear something? No, replied Lyriel. Can you? I thought someone, something was following before, said the dog. Now I'm certain something is coming up behind us. Something powerful, moving fast. It, it hedge? Or could it be Mogget again? I do not think it is Mogget. Whoever it is, we should try to leave it behind. And Lyriel turns around and is like, all right, we're going through this next gate. I'm fucking ready. And then that's the end of the chapter. I'm just so annoyed. Oh, what the fuck? What a place to stop. You guys, I can't handle it. Um, (laughs) Abby says, I've never found these creatures particularly scary. Abby, what? It never occurred to me they would be until Natasha started reading these books. And Laura says, without you, Natasha, I never would have given so much thought to the physical form of these creatures. I can't believe that you guys read these and that didn't make an impression on you. That's like one of my main takeaways from this series is that this guy is like a lunatic. It's like he's just got a bunch of he's got like mad libs and they're like taking body parts and just putting them into a a sack, like all of the words and just shaking them up. And he just picks random fucking body parts from random animals. And it's just like, yeah, the legs of a spider, the body of a hippopotamus, the face of a person, the teeth of an orangutan, like just I hate it. I hate it. Uh, All right. I am over time. So I have to go. But thank you both very much for coming and hanging out with me. Thank you, everybody who is listening. And I will be seeing you all again soon with a new episode. So until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.